So Mate, it's good though because this is how I get to know you even more. Yeah, because because we we had right before you um, left Dubai. Yeah. We had a, what, a coffee or something before you left, and we finally got a chance to chat. And we didn't get much of a chance before then, did we? No. And then you were like um, jetting off, getting back, getting back to the UK or whatnot. And um, and obviously, me and you just started to kind of cover some stuff about like what we've both done in the past and what we wanted to do over the next couple of years or so. And that, and that was it. And we're like, no. It was like literally such a brief meeting as well because yeah, yeah. you were so busy out there setting up and whatnot. It was crazy. Like it, it got worse as well. I think after you went, it was just so. It's just a, that was actually a really challenging three four weeks because mm. we're going through the visa process as well and sorting all that out, yeah. then trying to see clients and kind of draw up some new, new business. So yeah, it was madness. Of course, I want to dive a bit into that to be fair. But yeah. first, I just want to ask like, how did this all even start? So give me a little bit more background of who you are, what you're doing, how you managed to find what you're doing now. Yeah. So um, when you say how did it all start, as in literally from from the beginning, so to speak. Yeah. Um, Probably the best place to start there would be going kind of right back. So I came from like, I suppose what you call is like a typical working class standard background. I wouldn't say it's particularly challenging by any means, but then at the same point, um, mum and dad always struggled. And mm. I think the reason I mention that is because I suppose on a subconscious level, that's probably trickled through during my life and, and into my career. Mm. So um, as I got older, I, you know what, I never would have thought I'd end up doing this because I was always keen playing sports and doing that sort of thing. I played literally everything that you could think of. And then I got to university, studied business, mainly because I didn't know at the time really what else to do, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, that seemed to, I suppose, take my interest the most. Started uh, covering off some investment modules. And I was like, this sounds interesting. At the time, being what was 18, 20 year old lad, I was like, this sounds like gambling, you know. And I didn't know the yeah. difference between investing trading and really gambling at the time. I was like, it's, it sounds really interesting. So I got into it and obviously learned a lot more and realised it's nothing like, of course, gambling or, or betting kind of thing. Mm. Um, and that's how I got stuck into it. And obviously, um, over the 15 years now since I started my career in it, it's kind of evolved massively because at the start of my career, I was almost like a GP of financial advice, which is yeah. like a typical high street um, independent financial advisor as they're known. And then um, I suppose I went more into... Um, or bespoke more into certain niches, specifically, I suppose, more business owners, directors, C-suite level. So the sort of advice I give today is covered under a very general term, wealth management, which means a lot of things to a lot of people. But broadly speaking, it's, it's dealing with more high net worth individuals. Yeah. So people who typically, um, not they don't have to be, but have one million plus to invest as, as, as I suppose, net investable assets, as we call it. So they've actually got a liquid to to put in. Of course. Going back a bit, talking about your upbringing and that your family never really had much, is that kind of why you maybe took on what you do now? And is that like an extra motivation for yourself, do you reckon? Yeah, 100%. You know, at the time, you do, what's really interesting is going back like 10 years ago when I was probably five years into my career, yeah. I didn't really acknowledge that, you know, because you don't, you don't really, when you're in your mid 20s, late 20s, start kind of questioning why. I do this, why am I doing this? Like, mm -hmm. And um, it was only when I hired a business coach and he was, he was trying to help me and get to the bottom of kind of like my motivations. And he kind of went right back to the point where um, some of the things that happened when me and my sister were kind of younger and seeing mum and dad struggle, mm -hmm. I, I suppose seeing that made me think, you know what, I, I never want to be in that position. And I remember being really young and worrying that I was going to struggle like my mum and dad, and and I suppose the other side of the coin of that is, I um, I didn't want I want, wanted to be able to look after them in the future. It was horrible seeing your parents struggle. Mm. So don't get me wrong; it's not like we were out on the streets and, and people have it a lot worse, you know. But um, they struggled, you know, and and we're in debt all the time. So I think going I suppose fast forward in to today, one of the best things I get out of the job is helping people, you know, seeing people not struggle, retire early, help their kids, whatever. So a hundred percent, you know, mm -hmm. it's, de it's definitely pulled through to, to the experience I had when I was younger. And that, that motivation, I think will always be there. Yeah. And then have you managed to use your skills to then financially help and back your parents as well? Have, have you kind of like crossfired or is it? Yeah. So yes and no. And, and uh, a kind of a bit of a funny story actually. Um, and not, I don't think many people know this at all is when I first started advising, 
I was really proud of this knowledge I was gaining. So I went home and I said to my dad at the time, I was like, dad, did you know, like, this is kind of the situation with your pension, like you can do this. And I happened to mention in kind of just some general guidance I was giving him that he could access it from 55 onwards. Mm. So my dad unfortunately was terrible with money. And the minute I said that, he was like, well, I can, I can get hold of my pension. And it accrued a bit of debt. And unfortunately, despite me telling him not to do it, he drew on his pension and, and it was paying him a small amount per week, but he got the lump sum and paid off his debt. And lo and behold, a few years later, he was back in debt, had no pension, and he still had not retired at the time. Mm. Now, unfortunately, dad passed away over the following years, but if he hadn't, he'd have been absolutely stuffed when he comes to, when he comes to retirement. He'd probably been living off state pension benefits, 10, 12 grand a year or whatever. Mm. So it's quite funny because when I first started advising by accident, Dad heard just some general rules of money and advice, whatever, and, um, and made this decision. And I was trying to stop him and, and it actually had a negative effect. But fast forward again to, to today, I've been looking after my mum's own affairs for nearly, well, nearly 15 years. She trusted me from day one and she's done exceptionally well. So what has happened with her pensions investments is phenomenal because I've been looking after them for such a long period. And then obviously the, the success I've had I've managed to do some amazing things for her and yeah. for us as a family. So mum came out to the bar. I can't remember if I told you. Um, she came out so, to the bar. Oh, yeah. I saw it. And that was, that just, um, it was an incredible feeling having yeah. her there. From the minute she arrived in the airport to going around to different places, taking her out to eat, doing some activities and what. She'd never experienced anything like that. And because yes. we we grew up with, with, with no money, really, yeah. you know, she, it was a, it was like a different world. She'd never, never seen it. And um, just having those kind of, it was only four days or so, but kind of uninterrupted time with her um there's there isn't well there is a price in it because obviously it costs it costs money to do that but there isn't as well it, it, it was unforgettable so it's priceless in it seeing like it is. happiness within your parents and yeah stuff like that, so. it was surreal but it was it, it's one of those things i remember for a long time yeah how does it feel being able to do that now as well it, it, that has been one of the main things that motivated me from like when I was speaking to someone about this, a mentor, and this was this was years ago, and um, they were like, you, you need to be really confident about your why, and there needs to be emotional attachment. If you're mm -hmm. just doing something, you're chasing it for money, um, it, 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 that, that motivation will run out at some point in time. Yeah. And I think because we struggled, and my mum specifically did a lot for me and my sister, in the back of my mind, I was always like, you know what, I need to pay her back. She, honestly, I couldn't even list today the amount of stuff she's done that was way beyond what a normal mother would do. Mm -hmm. So to be able to to give back, whether it's my time and spend quality time with her or take her somewhere like, like when we were in Dubai, um, it is without a doubt one of the best things I've ever done. Yeah. And do you feel like money's such a weird thing, right? It's such a weird thing and it can make families or it can separate families yeah do you feel like from when you was growing up to potentially especially where your mum's at now because sadly your dad passed um has the relationship changed or has it always kind of stayed the same have you always been like close but basically yeah. what i'm saying is, is does has finance ever affected the family yeah it's definitely affected it's affected our family in the way it's probably affected as it affects most people mm. but I would say mainly positively, and, okay. and although that isn't the case for some, I think the reason it the reason it has affected us positively is it depends on your family dynamic. So when we didn't have any money, we didn't, it didn't feel like it in some respects. Me, my mum, my sister were really close. My dad, we weren't as close to, but we we almost came together um, to support each other all the time, and that in a way bonded us because there was kind of that difficulty with money. And I always remember um, my mum gamifying everything. You know, we'd go to the shops on bikes with little baskets on because we couldn't afford petrol to go to the supermarket. And mum would make it into a big game. So we were really close because we didn't have money. Now, um, when, because I've obviously become more successful over time, what, what's happened is I can do more for my mum, my sister, and little things, you know, when my sister comes to stay here, all the kit she's got at home in London, I've replicated here so she doesn't have to carry it all in the car. And that's a really nice thing to do. But I wouldn't mm. say it bonded us more. Yeah. But it just makes, and like you said, money's a weird thing. It doesn't buy happiness, but it makes life a lot more palatable, a lot mm. easier. And it also, which I think a lot of people don't um, really acknowledge sometimes, is it does solve some problems which unfortunately can make relationships, whether it's family or 
partners more yeah. difficult. Yeah, no, of course. I can, I yeah. can, I've experienced that with my parents. It's because with my side, it's been the opposite. So instead of it being a positive impact, it's been a negative. So my mum and dad was terrible with money. I used to gamble it a lot and stuff like that. So yeah, money. Do you feel money, like it kind of drove them, drove them kind of to, to have more conflict as a result? Yeah. And I think that's a big thing, right? Because when you've got a mortgage to pay off, when you've got kids, it's like money's such a, it is a big topic of discussion. And when you yeah. gamble it in order to then try with more money to then fund the family, it's a toxic cycle. And that's kind yeah. of what they got into. So it became quite toxic in the household. But uh, that's why I'm so like interested in finance now, because it's like, how can I break that pattern that my parents have gone through? Yeah. Because it can be a generational thing for sure, and it, it, I think a lot of people see that now online. You know, it's almost like people are uh, some people are motivated by almost changing the generational wealth, right? But I think one of the one of the biggest reasons people kind of argue, like couples, I mean, there's loads, I'm sure, but one of the main ones is money, of course. Mm -hmm. And and I never wanted that to be an issue for me, my family, or whatever. So it's one of those where you, you've got to be happy in yourself in the first place, right? Like anything in life, but it does help if you're well organized with your finances and you, you know what you're doing to make things a bit easier with people around you mm -hmm. and then that brings me on to the question of why should people seek advice like why would someone want to come to you rather than doing it themselves for example yeah i think um firstly most people don't know what to do so a lot of people do seek advice i mean i would say the majority I think what's difficult for someone like me to see when it's what I do for a living, right, is some people don't seek advice, try and do it themselves, and um, they're never going to be able to replicate or, or, or achieve the same sort of results from someone who does it as a career, or, or, or it's going to be near impossible, you know. I mean, if I take myself, you know, 15 years into my career, charted, it's all I've ever done, and for the sake of someone trying to save half a percent or a percent per annum in terms of like the an annual management charge, they might pay, pay an advisor. Mm -hmm. It's bonkers to think that a good advisor could not get you that in, in value back by giving you the right sort of advice, protecting the money, it performing better because the advisor knows what they're doing and what to invest in, the sort of service they give you, because it's not just about performance, it's about loads of other different solutions that may be suitable. Mm -hmm. So it, it's sad sometimes because I think people are reluctant to spend money on advice, but um, the cost difference between them doing themselves and, and, and using an advisor is, 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 in my opinion, not very significant compared to the advantages they have. 100%. And what have you found the reason why people look on because I've only recently just got into it all as well myself and, and seek advice. But before then, it's like, oh, I've got all this money. I'm all right. It's, it's sound. But yeah, if, yeah. if your money isn't working for you, it's kind of like just wasting money because it's not growing yeah, with the yeah. economy. So, yeah, like what... I forgot what my question was, to be honest, quite there. But So you're saying about, um, obviously, why people come and, and take advice. But are you, you going to mm. say, what if people have money, is there a motivator already? Yeah, I would say so. And it's also like, why do you think people tend to not seek advice as well? Because for me, it took a while. But for me, it was just because I was naive, for example. But yeah. people that are a little bit older understand it. Why do you think yeah. they might not seek advice? I think there's, um, I think there's loads of reasons. The first one is, is um, the industry. You know, I think there, there can be a lack of trust with people in, in my industry. And I think that applies to finance, banking, the, the lot. It's not wealth management specifically. So I think for some people, there's a lack of trust, skepticism around it. I think the other big one when I see clients come in sometimes and they do take advice and they haven't taken it sooner, it's just because they're busy. I mean, a lot of my clients are extremely busy, so they've just not put themselves first, which is crazy because, like you said, the hardest part is earning the money, you know, being good at what you do and bringing money through the door. The, the easier part is getting someone like me to help you make more of it or protect it or grow it. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think it's, it's, it's the time thing where people just put it to one side and think, I'll deal with it another day and then sometimes cost I think sometimes people are worried about the cost implications but normally with most investment firms there's only typically a fee when someone's managing your money mm -hmm. so it almost makes sense to go and have a conversation and see if they can help you know yeah. there not, normally isn't a loss to doing that no, or it's very rare because someone will have a conversation with you at no cost in yeah. most cases um, but yeah I, I would say that's probably the main drivers behind it so what should people look for when they're looking for a financial manager? Like what have you done differently, would you say, 
to make sure people feel that comfortable, that trust. Yeah, um, that's a really good one because I think a lot of people don't know what to look for and there's, there's obviously not a lot of guidance on that at all. Yeah. I think the, the first one, which is an obvious one, is qualifications. You know, um, typically to, to advise in the UK on investments specifically, you need what's called a level four qualification. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's various versions of it, but the main one being a diploma in, in, in essentially financial planning. You can go on beyond that and become chartered as a financial planner or as a wealth manager, they're kind of interchangeable. Mm -hmm. but if you were going to select an advisor, in an ideal world, you'd try and have someone who's gone to the pinnacle of the profession and been chartered. So obviously I, I covered that early on in my career, my first few years, and you know, I was like, right, I want to get to the top, be the best I can be. Um, but then I also really promote that with the advisors we're taking on board, you know, because we want them to be at the highest standard. So mm -hmm. that's a big one. Experience is, is useful, but it's not everything because I've met some advisors and I was one of them who, who was in the early stages of their career and their knowledge far supersedes someone who's been in 20 years. So mm -hmm. it's certainly not an age or tenure thing because you can have an advisor, and I've met plenty who have been going 20 years, and they're just doing the same thing every day, and they're not growing, they're not, they're not trying to expand their knowledge. Mm -hmm. So when I say experience, I don't mean kind of tenure in the industry, I, I mean what, what is their experience? Where, what firms have they worked at? What sort of advice do they deal with? So mm -hmm. that's kind of the big one. I think... Um, their specialism because you want to pick an advisor who is is really knowledgeable in the specific areas you may need advice mm -hmm. so for example if you're a business owner you really want to try and deal with someone who has a lot of experience dealing with business owners mm -hmm. if you work in a specific specific niche so say doctors for example surgeons there's advisors I know who specialise in dealing with people in that category or the NHS as a whole mm -hmm. so I think that's um, a really good one and then also it's the the firm someone works for because you can have a great advisor a, a terrible firm that has very limited resources or unfortunately you can have a really poor advisor at a great firm that has loads of resources mm -hmm. so i think you've got to see what sort of support they've got around them in terms of a team resources scope the way they can invest because mm -hmm. that will make a big difference in the the standard of advice you get 100 percent. why do you think why do you think it is that people that want to expand the skills and get very comfortable to where at because you see that a lot as well why don't they want to yeah because that surely affects the growth right yeah yeah i think i think people get complacent um mm. like probably any 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 career mm -hmm. and i think the reason for that is there's plenty of advisors i know who have become fairly successful you know that once you've kind of built a client bank up you know unless you do a terrible job you know clients know you they're very like unlikely to leave if you're doing a good job mm. Um, and then to go out and get clients is hard. It is really hard um, to find new clients. So I think some advisors get to a certain point where they're quite happy where they are. They don't need to learn anymore, so they, they just don't. Mm. If you want to, obviously, um, also, I suppose, grow or expand your, your kind of knowledge, there's only really two routes. You can become a lot more knowledgeable, but there's no point unless you specifically use it with more complex clients, and then you've got to find clients with more complex needs, and that's traditionally more high net worth people, you know, who've got very complex affairs. Mm. Or you decide to grow a business, you know, not just be an advisor at a firm or a one man band. Mm. You think, well, I'm gonna build a team. And then you need a completely different skill set because you might be a great advisor, but you might not be a good business owner, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I think it just comes down to the individual, but it's difficult, you know, going from an advisor to building an advisory firm, that, yeah. that is a big, there's a big difference in that. Of course, and you've done that yourself. So then my question is, how did you get to that point? How did you scale? And uh, my secondary question is, what's the most enjoyable thing about your job now that you have, well, you have the skills to then help people's financial situations, but also now you manage a team. So, I mean, it's probably like four questions in yeah, that. Yeah. But what's the best thing about your job? And how, firstly, how did you manage to get to it to where it's at now? Yeah, so I was quite fortunate. When I say fortunate, I, when I was um, in the early stages of my career, all I wanted to do was absorb everything, learn more, and, and if I didn't know something, I'd do more and more research into it, and I'd want to take on more responsibility. And one thing I've realised now, when I've seen other people work, is some people don't want to do that for whatever reason. So um, what, I suppose what I did was take on as much responsibility as possible and learn a lot of skills in previous, previous roles that enabled me to know how to build a business. So if I'd not pushed myself in the first place, I would have never built them up. And then I got to a certain point where I realized, you know, I could 
set up my own investment firm. I could do this on my own. I had some great contacts, mm. um, professional connections like solicitors, accountants that, that obviously I, I worked alongside that can refer clients. So it got to a certain point where I was like, you know what, oh, I want to kind of set up on my own. And the main reason for that was really to build my own culture and team because the firm I worked at previously, a lot of the employees came to me about all sorts and I loved it, building, kind of training new advisors, helping the team, growing the business, working on the market straight. I liked being, I liked the variation of work. Mm -hmm. So when I left and, and uh, decided to set them on my own, I had this blank canvas where I could do whatever I want in the sense of build a culture that I'm really proud of, a really nice environment for people to work in. Yeah. I could carry on training mm -hmm. new advisors, see them be successful. So just like I love seeing my clients do well, it's the same, but with your advisors, and then they go and help more people. So you you kind of almost really helping a wider range of people if you're you you obviously um, setting up the, the firm. And then I think um, the other one was having a bit of flexibility in in the way, in the sense of the way I delivered advice. I, I couldn't do that in previous firms, mm. whereas I wanted to give advice that I truly believed in that I knew was was the best possible advice I could give to clients. So it got to the point, you know, I was just turning into my thirties at this point, I was like, I've got to do this, you know, for all, all these reasons. Yeah. Did you always know you're going to do your own thing, like set up your own business? <sighs> yeah, yes and no, that's a really loaded question because when I was younger, um, I was always entrepreneurial, like all through uni, I had little businesses, did yeah. stuff on eBay, like I was always like it. Um, then my first role as an independent financial advisor, an IFA, like a high street advisor, um, it was self-employed, had no base salary, which a lot of the younger generation will never do now. You know? mm -hmm. we, we interview people all the time and they're terrified to do it, but I was happy to take on the risk because of the reward and capped earnings. I did that and, and that was like having a mini business at the time, you know, because I was completely self-employed, did run my own diary, you know. Um, when I went to the next role, I joined forces with someone who was starting a business or in the early stages, helped him build the business. So I kind of, in some respects, did feel like a business owner at that point. Mm -hmm. I didn't think while I was with this person at the time that I was going to leave through 99% through, through of the time of being there. It was only right in the last year where I could see it taking a turn for, for, for reasons that I won't, won't go into, in fairness to the, to the chap. Um, so during that time, I thought I was going to be there forever and help him build the business. And it was only when the, the certain, well, certain things happened, should we say, that oh, I didn't agree with. Mm -hmm. and I couldn't stand by that I thought you know what I need to go and set up on my own and do this so mm -hmm. I suppose the short answer is I could see it coming because I was entrepreneurial mm -hmm. but it was only really when I kind of got pushed down that route that I thought you know what I, I need to do this now there's no other option you know of course and what's the difference is that um, what would you say is the difference between working for a firm and then running your own firm and then from that from working with other firms what have you learned and implemented into your own business but also stuff that you haven't implemented. Yeah. So I'll try and remember the whole, the whole of that question. So what was the first part? Um, what have I learned from the previous firm? Yeah, it's a little bit of a controversial question, but it's, it's quite an interesting one because it's, it is like you've, you've made that shift now. You've worked with someone before in the firm, yeah. almost in like an entrepreneurial kind yeah, of yeah. environment, but then you've gone on and done your own business. Uh, yeah. So what, what's the differences between working with someone in that setting than having your own because I can imagine there's some differences. Yeah, th th there's a lot. Um, the, the role I was in before, like you said, was actually quite really entrepreneurial. Now I ran my own diary, like uh, I had meetings when I liked, you know, it was uncapped earnings, you know, so what I put in, I got out, which yeah. was higher risk, you know, so there was a lot of similarities and a lot, I think a lot of people miss that now and they don't realize you can go into a company and have an amazing career mm -hmm. as, a, as an entrepreneur and also not have a lot of the downsides. Mm -hmm. The main difference, the first thing that sprang to mind when you started saying that was the, the stress. And it is, it is, it is not to be kind of understated. So um, I knew it would be hard going into it, but I don't think I appreciated to the, the level it is. Because I used to about to go home, and I, I always worked, but I could go home at five and carry on my emails, I always worked, but it's not the same now. Because when I, I suppose in my head, I never go home. Mm -hmm. I'm always thinking, oh, what happens if this happens? Or have I forgot about this? Or what am I going to do next with the business? And you just can't shut off. And I have this conversation with so many of the business owners. And it is such a, a transition. And people don't realize that that part of your life goes. You know, can be, compared to being employed, you, you're kind of always working through stuff in your head. And when stuff doesn't work out the way it does, 
it's hard, you know, it's really stressful. And yeah. I think the, the big one is also the responsibility. And the, pe- people, I don't think, really appreciate this. When you employ a team, it doesn't matter if you've got 10 people or 100 people, mm. you are responsible for them. And you can't one day, if you're not feeling well, just think, ah, oh, you know, I'm not going to turn up. Or you can't do something reckless mm-hmm. that puts everyone's livelihoods at, 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 at stake. Because they all have partners, families, you know, bills to pay. Yeah. And if you, exp- <laughs> if you fuck up, you know, the, the, the bottom line is you're going to ruin people's lives. And that is, is quite a heavy weight to, to carry. Now, I'm sure there's some people out there who probably don't worry as much as I do, but that, that is a lot. And um, mm. when you sometimes look at um, someone who works for you, who kind of goes home four or five o'clock, you know, they, they just have their own responsibility mainly, you know, not, not that of the firm. So yeah. that was the biggest thing, you know, com- the biggest comparison. Um, the upside is that I have the flexibility to build the business how I like. And the really common misconception is that when you're a business owner, you can do what you like, you've got flexibility, <laughs> like the world you always do. Mm-hmm. It's actually the opposite, because what happens is you tend to, and near enough, any, every business owner I know says this, you tend to work a lot more hours, you don't necessarily yield more benefit um, compared to, to when you're employed. So. The flexibility bit is a bit of a myth. It's more about flexibility of doing things the way you believe is best. Of course. Do you feel a sense of pressure knowing that you have your own business, you have almost like people underneath you that rely on you? Because it is a different pressure, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Having that sort of responsibility. It's massive. Like, like it, I, think, I think it is underestimated because the only way I can explain it is when, when I was younger, for example, suddenly something happened or you had to change your heart or you just didn't want to work, work in a job anymore, you can just quit. Mm-hmm. Or if something happens in your life, like something significant that happens to you personally, you can just go off the radar and you see that, you know. I've, I've seen that with friends, I've seen that with family members where something happens and, yeah. and they can just disappear, they can have a wobbly for a few months, their heart might not be in it anymore. But when you're in a business, you, you can't do that. No. You've got no options. And you can't just one day think, oh, you know what, I'm not keen on this anymore, I'm going to pack it in. Yeah. Because there's all these people that are relying on you. You're kind of trying to lead them. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that's, adds a lot of pressure. That's what makes you different, though, I think. Um, just from knowing you briefly, I can tell that you take pride in what you do. So I know that's going to trickle down into the advisors that you get. So my question on top of that is, what do you look out for in terms of advisors and yep. people getting on boards within the team? The biggest thing I look for with advisors specifically, because when I'm recruiting advisors or what we class as kind of support staff for those advisors, yeah. you definitely look for different qualities. Okay. Advisors specifically, I look for something called grit. And I was using this term for, you know, for a while and then it's actually been coined by, I think it's Angela Duckworth. She's done a book. This is a, I think she's a psychologist in Stanford or something like that. I'm probably completely wrong. <laughs> but she talks about grit and it's these qualities like resilience and mm. perseverance. And you, in my industry, you need that grit. You know, you've got to be able to kind of keep almost like taking those punches and keep going and keep going and persevere because it's a hard industry, you know. Mm. When it goes well, it's fine, you know, when markets are going up, when markets take a tumble back, even though you're not responsible for the, the war in Russia and Ukraine, clients somehow think you're linked to it <laughs> and, and then you've caused that. So um, so advice, I think the big thing is, is having that grit, you know, resilience, perseverance, determination, seeing stuff through. A lot of self-discipline and motivation, I think, is key. Yeah. With the support, it's more about attention to detail, you know, and 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 just, I suppose, well, it is more attention to detail. I'm being really qualified for their position because you can't make mistakes in my industry. You know, you're dealing with people's money, mm. so you've got to have people that you can rely on. That's the best one, reliability, and that's on both sides. Reliability is one of the main things we look for. Got to show up. Yeah, and, and you'd be surprised. It's hard sometimes because you just need a safe pair of hands in our industry because it's so serious yeah. if you do make a mistake. How do you manage it when you get overwhelmed? Because I'm assuming that comes about a bit. I know I get overwhelmed a lot right now. I'm yeah, in an yeah. overwhelming phase. But it's weird because it's like I want to take some time to myself, but we're in a phase where we're growing, so it's almost like I can't take that time to myself. Have you ever been in that situation and how have you dealt with it? Yeah, I do. Um, and 
I've got a lot better in the last few years of dealing with it. Um, one of the things I do is meditation, like everyone's kind of seems to be getting on yeah. now, and it does work. I find it difficult because the minute I sit still for two minutes, my mind's going, you know, it's yeah. racing. Um, and I think taking a bit of time, even if it's five, 10 minutes, and I use the Calm app, you know, it's Calm and Headspace and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, even if I just listen to, to something um, on there, and it might be specifically about a topic, you know, stress, anxiety, whatever, gratitude, I think is one of the best ones, yeah. um, in my opinion anyway. Um, that really helps kind of just centre me a little bit more. The other thing is, is, is now I try and take a step back and think, look, this is what I have done, these are all the wins, mm -hmm. and try and not put the pressure on myself, not have so many meetings, because in the past I've made myself really ill um, um, doing that. Yeah. So, yeah, and, and, and exercise, you know, that's, I, I, I've been into my gym, sports, my entire life. If I didn't train every day, do that sort of thing, uh, I'd be tearing my hair out. So I think that is absolutely fundamental, especially in doing what I do. Well, you said that's the hardest part of owning a business. So yeah. It's because I think a lot of people that don't own businesses, again, think back to the, oh, well, you're on holiday, you can take time off, you can do this and the other. But yeah. time is so precious when you have a business. And if you don't know how to manage your time, things can go so wrong. Yeah. So, yeah, like, how would you answer that question? What, what part of it? Sorry. I was just trying to understand, like, how do you manage your time, I guess? Yeah. When it comes to when it comes to that point where it, where you feel like you're getting overwhelmed because time is how you kind of figure everything out in some essence. Yeah, I think you, you cannot. I've not met very many people who are successful in any respect, regardless if they're business owners or not, mm. um, who aren't really good at managing their time. And uh, for example, I have to be up early, do the work I did before getting to the office in the day because mm. if I didn't. Meetings would fall apart. You know, I'd be turning to meetings, and my clients would be looking at me, thinking, "How have you not prepared this?" Yeah. But the only way I could get around that is, and not having to get up so early, is by having less meetings and um, doing that prep in say the first few hours of the the, the working day. Mm -hmm. But there is not enough time in the day, so you've got to really prioritise. You know, look at your life, personal and work. Mm -hmm. And you've got to be really critical and say, should I be doing this or should someone else be doing it? Or is this a waste of time? Yeah, yeah. And, and there's a really good book called The One Thing. And it always reminds me about focusing on the one thing that is the, the game changer, the needle mover. And um, that always resonates with me. So now I step back sometimes and think, am I being a busy idiot or yeah. should I be focusing on this? But time management, prioritizing stuff and, uh, and whatnot is, 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 is one of the most important skills. 100%. And it's... I was thinking that in my head, to be honest. How, how has that affected, if it has affected anything, that is, your personal relationships? Because business has consumed a lot of time. Yeah, have, yeah. have you had your fair shares of like personal relationships or anything like that? Yeah, that's suffered as a result. Yeah. Yeah, so interestingly, no. Mm. Uh, well, yes and no. So, so I say yes and no, it seems like to most questions, but there's two sides of it. So there was a previous relationship I had and I worked a lot, and this individual um, at the time, um, she wanted a lot of my time, and yeah. we were going through a transition period anyway as a couple. And oh, I did give her probably the same amount of time as any other person, but I was also very career focused. Mm. And that made it hard. If I'd had a regular job, we might have had a little bit more time and there'd been a little bit more stress, mm. but that relationship would have probably ended up in the same, uh, going down the same path it did anyway. Yeah. Um, with my current partner, you know, we've been together seven or so years now. And what's really interesting is I am confident I spend more time with her than what your average person would spend with their partner. Because when you when you run a, run a business, and it's probably not the same for everyone, but it certainly is for me, you have to be really regimented with your time. But what people think sometimes is they think, oh, it's so strict, you know, there's no flexibility and, and that you, you have a boring life because it's so routine. Yeah. It's actually the opposite. When you're regimented and really organized, it gives you freedom back mm. because you're not chasing your tail all the time. So we get up in the morning, we go to the gym, she'll do her own thing in the gym, we'll come back, we'll go for a walk for an hour, you know, get a chance. Like how many couples go for a walk every morning for an hour, mm. an hour and a half, get a coffee together, walk the dog, you know, it's a really quality time. Yeah. Okay, we do talk about work quite a bit. And, um, and then in the evening, I then, because I've done some prep work following that, before work, in the evening, when we come home, you know, it, it's dinner, relax, watch something on Netflix. So yeah. we get that quality time in. Of course. Did your missus work for you then? Yeah, works within the business. Oh, mad. So yeah, how's that yeah. dynamic then? 
It's, um, it's a really interesting one, actually, because before she joined the business, mm-hmm. um, I kind of um, wasn't sure if that would be the right move because it's is, it is risky, you know. It's yeah. risky mixing your partner in business or even your friends, right? Mm. Because you can destroy a relationship if it, if it doesn't work. Of course. Um, I consulted with loads of my clients at the time, you know, that are also I consider kind of friends as well. And um, ones that specifically would be probably well well placed to give me advice on this, and all of them said, don't do it. They're okay. like, do not have your missus in the business. Um, apart from one, I won't say who he is, because obviously I can't anyway. Um, and we did a massive pros and cons list. We thought about it for well over six months. And in the end, we are like, you know what, we're going to have to do this, because the disadvantages of not doing it were too significant, you know. Mm. I wanted to have the flexibility to travel more as time goes on. And she'd have been restricted to your 20 days holiday. And if she was in the business, you know, there would have been no restriction as long as she's doing her work. Of course. So, um, so we made that call and it's one of the best things we ever did. Now, it's not always been easy. And in the first couple of years, I think she found it difficult to separate the work and the personal. You know, mm. she'd bring it home a bit. And, you know, you don't, no one wants to be the, the boss to their missus at work. You know, you don't want to be telling people what to do you know, when you care about them. But you've got to separate the two. And I, I find it quite easy to do yeah. that. And I, I can do that with friends or anyone. And it will have no bearing on the personal relationship. You know, yeah. if, they, if there was a dispute, so to speak, and you're working for a problem, you know, outside of solving that, you know, I'm, I'm fine with people, you know, it just yeah. doesn't bother me. But she struggled. Uh, but now she's totally different. You know, that, that never happens. And we've grown closer together because we've gone through so much stuff within the business together, you know, yeah. the challenges we face, we face together. Yeah, I was literally about to ask that because what spoke to me then was you literally, did you actually write a list of pros and cons? Yeah, literally. I find that so interesting. That's yeah. really cool. Like no one really does that or speaks about that. You've got to, it's your, it's your lives on the line. And I had, I felt like I had a lot of responsibility, right? Because what you've got to think is she was going to leave a career Yeah. and I don't want her to come and work with me, and it is with me, and I don't want her to think she's working for me because it's not the case, we're gonna build together. And I don't ever want her to look back and think, AI influenced her, or to to make that decision. I want her to make her own decision. I want her to go in eyes wide open to the pros and the cons. So I really wanted to guide her and and, and help her on on that. and I wouldn't want her to have any regrets. Mm. And thankfully, as far as she's told me, you know, she's, she's, she, it's been hard, she'll say, I'm sure. Yeah. And not hard between us. I mean, just hard building a business. She's had the same experience with me. Yeah. But it's been highly rewarding. Her. And, and we do have a bit of a joke about, obviously, her position before. I said, would you, I would say to her, she loved the company, so no, no, there's no disrespect to the company. But I said, would you ever go back to doing your kind of marketing role, which was what she was doing? Yeah. She was like, oh, it's, it's unrecognizable now. She's our ops director. You know, Ridiculous. I find that really cool, me. What's one thing that, oh, we'll get back to business, but I'm very intrigued by this because I've got misses myself. What's one thing that you've learned during that process? Has it bettered the relationship and do you feel like you understand each other a lot more? Massively. You, you, you cannot, um, you, I cannot even put to words, it feels like, the, the strength it adds because you tackle things together that you just don't normally ever have to tackle mm. as a couple outside of it. Yeah. And you've got to pick up skills when you're running a business that you you don't necessarily normally use in, outside of work yeah. but then when you but, but naturally as a result of that you could be dealing with for example friends and mm. you'll end up being a lot more diplomatic than what maybe some friends of yours yeah. would be yeah. because you've learned how to run a business and how to deal with people better and be considerate of other people's perspectives, mm. find common ground, you get better at like conflict resolution, you, you, you enhance your skills in loads of ways and they're transferable then outside of work. So that's yeah. why you see a lot of people who, who also have a good personal life because it kind of overlaps. And um, I think massively, you know, it, it's really helped the relationship. And when you've gone through some really challenging stuff in a, in a work environment together, when you have issues outside of work, which some couples might struggle with, mm-hmm. you know, we look at them and you just think that it's nothing. Yeah. You know, we've gone through a court case together, we've gone through all sorts, and um, you just look at it and you think, why are you even, are you even worry about it? Of course. Yeah. No, that's, that's very interesting, that perspective. I, think, I find that really cool. Right, back to business. Yeah. If I own a business, which I do, yeah. so this is really key information for me, what's five things that I should be doing with my money? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, the first thing I'll probably acknowledge is it depends what stage you are yeah. uh, as a business owner, you know, because someone starting out and being, say, a one-man band or small team is going to have a different needs to, say, um, a business owner who's 
for example, got a thousand employees, mm -hmm. but the, 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 the best one and the most effective, in my opinion, and I need to be very clear, I'm not giving financial advice here, else I'll get shot. Um, I think putting into pensions is, yeah. is one of the best things you can do for various reasons. You know, you're saving for your future, your retirement. Most people don't save enough, so packing it away is, is obviously um, a no-brainer. But it's the tax reliefs you get. You know, you save your income tax, capital gains tax, if you have a business and you're limited, a corp corporation tax. And um, you can, if you... Uh, have passed a certain level of wealth mm. um, or you will if you have passed a certain level of wealth pay inheritance tax which is significant is 40 percent mm. so as a business owner if you contribute into your pension you're saving across all of these or, or should i say potentially saving across them and in my opinion it is one of the most tax efficient things you can do as a business owner mm -hmm. so I, um, I, I have this conversation so many times with business owners and they cannot believe it when I explain it properly to them. And sometimes they're like, damn, why is my accountant never told me this? Mm. And I'm like, I can't comment on that, you know, because it's more their, their role than me, you know, saving tax. But it's so significant that the difference it will make. So one of the best things is, is pensions. Um, Second one is when there's excess funds building up in a business if they're not used and they're going to be there long term, you can you can have an investment account within your company and not a lot of people know that. They just think if they have an investment account, it's personal, you know, mm -hmm. outside, but you can actually have your money in the company invested. And that would probably apply to companies when they're a bit bigger. Um, another one is having life cover through the business. Um, there's certain life cover you can put through the business that's really tax efficient and Again, not, not a lot of people are aware of it. They didn't realise they could put it in place and have the business pay for it and it not be considered a benefit in kind. But again, it's a very specific type of cover yeah. um, without delving into advice. Um, the other one is, is, is what we call a, a cash management facility. And some businesses don't realise, they just stay with their current bank, um, which is paying them hardly anything. I know it's a bit better at the minute with interest rates. But um, there's online platforms that you can invest in that we provide as an example. And it has access to literally hundreds of banks with hundreds of different types of accounts so they can mix and match in terms of what sort of rates they want to get what access they need mm -hmm. and that's um, a really really useful one and the final one which probably applies to bigger businesses would probably be when someone wants to sell their business and this can still be kind of a one-man band if you have a client book you got a thing and you can over the space of a couple of years because really you want two years minimum yeah. transition a business into something that is worth something or if it's worth something already transition to something that's worth a lot more and maximize that value mm -hmm. and a lot of people come to me for for that sort of planning you know they're, they're planning to sell their business the the back end you know investing the proceeds and producing an income is the yeah. easy part for me but it's helping them in that transition period bringing in the right people like corporate solicitors maybe tax yeah. advisors but they're the, the, the main things. If it was you specifically, you know, at your stage, I think given your age, you know, you want to be putting money aside into a pension yeah. and just squirreling that aside every every month. Of course. What do you think about ISAs? Because I've got an ISA. I'm yeah, looking yeah. to start pension next year yeah. whilst I'm young. Um, but what's the differences between the two? Because I know pensions, there's a little bit more benefits as a business owner. Yeah. But in terms of the general public, what's the difference and which, which would you recommend is... I mean, both is ideal. But yeah, say yeah. if someone is on a nine to five wage around 22, 25,000 a year. Yeah, yeah. What would you suggest is better for those kind of? Yeah, it's a great question. I have to be really careful what I say because I can't give um, financial advice. But what I can say is a pension and ISA, one is, is not accessible until a lot later in life. You know, 55 currently will be pushing up to 57 under legislation that's coming out in the coming years. Yeah. With an ISA, you know, you've got liquidity. You could always take the money out if you need it so it's about what stage of life you're at and if you're younger for example like, like yourself Tom you might choose to fund an ISA more whether it's a stocks and shares ISA that has investments in it or a cash ISA is another another conversation but you might choose to do that so you're not locking your money away until later later in life mm. um, if you want in my opinion more tax efficiency you would probably go to the pension because they've both got tax reliefs mm. but the pensions pension tends to be slightly more tax efficient of course but a pension is usually like traditional retirement kind of um, fun pot, let's just say. Yeah, yeah. Do you feel like, well, is it even worth it these days? Or do you think there's other alternatives that might be a little bit more better with how the economy and everything's going? Yeah. So it's, the whether pensions are worth it, and, and kind of, I suppose, a lot of myths around pensions, it, it is 100% worth it. It is probably one of the best financial planning solutions you can have in place 
compared to most of the things that, that are on offer in the UK. Um, I think they're just misunderstood. People don't fund them enough. Um, people don't review them enough, and that's why they potentially don't have um, what they need um, when it comes to retirement. Remember, a pension is in essence just a wrapper, and you can hold, in, in some, some respects, whatever you like in it. Obviously, it depends what firm you deal with as to what you're allowed or can or cannot, yeah. or, or get advised to hold in that pension. But if you put a load of, a load of, a load of crap in it, it's not gonna do much. Yeah. If you have really good investments, you have a good wealth manager who knows what he's doing, the pension's gonna do really well. Yeah. The same applies though to an ISA and a lot of other investment solutions. So really, it's not about the wrapper as much, whether it's an ISA, pension, investment account, whatever. It's more about the strategy Mm. within the vehicle itself, within the pension. Okay. But because of the tax efficiencies around pensions, it is one of the best solutions out on the table for people in the UK. Got you. But it's, so that, that's very interesting what you said there. Is that why it's so important to kind of do your research when you're looking for a wealth manager and making sure that they've had a good rapport with previous people rather than just going for any sort of wealth manager? Yeah, 100%. I mean, one thing I personally try and do now is be more visible online, a bit like yeah. me and you talking today, you know, mm -hmm. because if you can do a lot of due diligence on the person you're potentially going to be working with for the long term mm -hmm. and you can see there's, they've got a strong track record, you know, there's other people they deal with, especially in your niche, yeah. that's going to give you a lot of confidence because it's hard to hide in my industry. You know, if you do a bad job and, and let people down or don't deliver, you know, it's going to be everywhere. It's going to be on social media, Google reviews, whatever you, you can think of. Mm -hmm. So... I spend a lot of time trying to make myself visible, giving people my FCA details, um, giving them all the resources where people have left reviews on LinkedIn, all that sort of thing, yeah. so they can do their due diligence and they don't have to take that kind of um, leap of faith when they start dealing with me. Mm -hmm. Also, you can put them in touch with the existing clients, you know, and I've done that a number of times. You know, when someone's been a bit nervous and said, look, Dan, I'm, you know, I'm really keen to work together, but you know, I'm still a bit unsure. If that ever is the case, I'll, I'll just put them in touch with a range of clients. And, oh, um, and um, let them do some further due diligence. Of course, everything's about trust, right? Yeah, it is. Well, in my industry, it's the biggest thing. It's the biggest feedback I get from clients. It's, it's about the trust and, and you more than the firm. 100%. Now, I want to ask a question as well, personally for myself. Um, is there different types of investment funds rather than just the ISA and pension? Because I'm sure that there's more different investment funds than just the two. Yeah, right? yeah. So what? which ones are they and which are the benefits for each one? Yeah, so that is for this podcast near enough impossible to answer oh, okay. because, <laughs> because there's loads okay. so it's that's a bit like you asking me um, what are the names of all the football teams in the UK and all the players within them all right um, so, so there's a lot what what, to, what what is I suppose the question you're probably trying to get at is when you say investment funds a, a fund is just typically a company that invests in loads of other companies right what you're referring to when you talk about like an ISO or pension is more like a wrapper that you would put yeah. investment funds in. Yeah. And that wrapper or that vehicle, there is a lot of them like you, you were suggesting. So a pension is one of them. Yeah. Then you've got something like a stocks and shares ISA, an investment account. There's things called investment bonds, which are another type of wrapper. Mm -hmm. Then there's certain schemes that give tax relief called venture capital trusts, okay. enterprise investment schemes. These aren't simple solutions, some of these. And right. to know which one to use and, and where to advise for a client, you have to go through a full fact-finding process. You know, you're talking a couple of hours. Um, understand the circumstances, goals, the bigger picture stuff. Mm -hmm. Then understand what would be an appropriate investment strategy. And then how it all fits together as one holistic strategy. And I only named probably, what, five, six of them. There's yeah. way more than that. Okay. So this is why, you know, when you ask me, you know, why don't people, why don't people take advice and, and do you think people can not take advice? Of course yeah. they can't. They can't know that because just one of them, like if you take pensions, the legislation, on, that is, that the legislation on pensions is so complicated mm. and so much has happened over the years that even if you just took one of them, you know, there's huge there was multiple exams just on that one vehicle right yeah yeah so um it's, it's a tough question to answer that yeah it's, it's it's an interesting one though as well because i didn't know that there was that many sort of pockets let's just say yeah to invest your money and i don't know if you can answer this question either but so the ones that you mentioned there like the bonds and stuff yeah is that for someone that's earning or a company if a if if company can invest in it um, is that for people that are on a, like almost like a higher kind of level or is that for like people? No, okay. not necessarily. So um, 
most of those those those, those kind of vehicles or wrappers I mentioned yeah. um, are available to to, to most people. Yeah. So it's not really about the level of wealth; it's about the suitability and what you're trying to achieve. Because they have some of them have different tax um, efficiencies than others. Some don't have yeah. really any at all. Um, so with what you need to do is really understand what the client's trying to achieve mm-hmm. and their circumstances, and then it's almost like you can start putting this together and working out what ones or one mm-hmm. is most suitable for them. But just like you can put any amount with some providers into a stocks and shares ISA or a pension, you know, you could start off with 20 quid a month. Yeah. Um, you can with some of them. The, the only time there's limits, I think, is... is, is depending on the firm you're dealing with. And that's normally for it to be cost effective for a client. Yeah. Because for example, if we were going to set up a stocks and shares ISA for a client um, and it's not in their interest because it's not cost effective and they can do it, um, or they can they can achieve what they're trying to achieve elsewhere at a lower cost, we'll be honest with them. Mm. But because we're a holistic wealth management firm in the sense of there's not too much we can't do, we've got su- such, a, such a breadth of resources, mm. That is factored into our pricing, right? And yeah. if someone just came to me and said, Dan, all I want to do is put fifty pounds a month aside into a stocks and shares ISA, yeah. we'd have to give some serious thought if 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 they're suitable as a client, because if that's all they were going to do for the next ten years, it might be best referring them to someone else so they save money and it's the right thing for them. Yeah. Um, if they had all these other things they need help with, they're going to get more value from us and then it'd be more suitable that us having them as a client. So hopefully that helps. No, of course. And speaking of like the markets currently, how do you think people are taking it at the moment because the market's down or not yeah. the best, let's just say, at the moment? Um, how do you deal with that sort of feedback from clients? Because I'm sure some people are pretty worried. Yeah, so, so over the last 18 months, markets have been really choppy. And what's really interesting is clients who have been with me for some time, and when I say some time, maybe over two years plus, mm-hmm. You, they don't really get worried because I've had two years to build their knowledge and educate them. So they actually realise there's a lot of um, opportunity when the markets do drop back. You know, they understand there's value there because, in really simple terms, if you think about it just logically, if the markets drop back because something happened, you know, Russia, Ukraine, interest rates, inflation, what, what's gone on in the last 12 months, there you'll find the intrinsic value of a company might still be here, the true value of it, and the share price is down here. So there, 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 there's that gap there mm-hmm. that exists, and our investment team can go in and obviously take advantage of those opportunities. And when the markets rise, you know, as a result, the portfolios do better. So when clients, when you build clients' knowledge up and they start understanding these basic principles of investing, um, you don't have the 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 kind of issues of them calling the office with with concerns, and we never really get inquiries like that you know calls from existing clients saying they're worried Mm -hmm. it's more someone who's new you know just come on board in the last six months then the markets have dropped back and obviously they're a bit nervous anyway they've just placed their trust in you so you've got to really um hold their hand and and guide them during that period but the most important thing i try and remind clients to be aware of is you've got to use suitable yardsticks and what i mean by that is it's not about whether investments have gone down or up it's really about are is our performance lower than our peers or the market or have we outperformed mm. in relation to it? And you can outperform on the downside. If the markets go down 20% and our portfolios only go down 10% or yeah. our peers go down 20%, we only go down 10%, we've done a great job. Mm. And clients don't really acknowledge that, which is quite frustrating. You know, they, they won't turn around if their portfolio drops back in a, in a crisis and say, great job for protecting some of the risk for yeah. us. When the markets go up, what's, what's really interesting is if I said to a client, oh, you've, you've made 10% this year and the peers have done 12% and they aren't aware that the benchmarks have actually done better, they might think we've done well if I've not educated them what to look for. Mm. So I spend a lot of time trying to say to clients, this is what you should compare us against. These are legitimate benchmarks. You can assess performance in downward and upward markets. But I'll tell you what, Tom, you know, markets drop back and you can have people obviously ask you questions more and have more concerns. But when the markets go up, and the portfolios put the clients' portfolios are doing really well. Like, Does anyone call you? you and, <laughs> yeah, well, no one calls you and pats you on the back. I mean, they're happy in the reviews. Yeah, but no one, no one calls you and pats you on the back. It's just quite a tough job in some in some respects. Yeah, I can imagine. So, speaking about people being worried, I've heard that it's the best time to kind of keep investing money when the markets are down. So then, when the market goes back up, it has a greater return of investment. Is that correct, or is that? A misconception? Yeah, broadly speaking, it is. Because when markets drop back, it presents an opportunity, right? Things mm. are at a discount. And investments is so hard, you know, it's one of the few 
industries in the world where people do the opposite of what they should be doing. Yeah. So if you imagine you were gonna, you wanted a new car and you kind of drove past um, the garage and everything's at a 20% discount, you think, God, you know, now the time, now is the time to buy, right? Mm -hmm. um, but in the, in the investment world, you know, when markets drop by 20%, people panic and sell. Um, and I think the, the key thing there is you need to be confident in how you're invested and you need to be invested appropriately, well diversified in, in the first place. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, to answer your question, Tom, yeah, you, definitely. When markets drop back, you know, it's a good time to invest in most cases. Yeah. Um, but of course, every market drop is different and has its own circumstances. So you, you take that with a pinch of salt. Mm -hmm. But if you have good investment advice, a good a well-constructed portfolio in the first place, yeah. you know, then then that's probably more important than the timing. 100%. And would you say, on top of that question then, is it possible to even lose money? Or if you're smart enough and you don't sell, is it always going to go back up yeah. in the longevity of things? This is, an, this is a fantastic question because I get asked this in near enough every meeting. So you can never say it's impossible to lose money. And it really depends on how a client's invested, who they're invested in, what, they're, what they've invested in. That dictates whether they can lose it. If you invest in a single stock or share, so to speak, or bond, you know, there's always the probability and it's higher because you're in a single asset. Mm -hmm. So I don't care how good a company is, it could be Apple or Amazon, not to kind of name all the A's. Um, but we've seen massive companies disappear overnight. Mm -hmm. Now, when you're invested in a well-diversified portfolio of funds, and say each fund is invested in 50, 100 companies all over the world in different industries and sectors in some cases, you might have a portfolio of investments mm. that is in the region of 1,000 positions, maybe, in some cases. Yeah. Now, if I ask you the question, what's the probability of your money, kind of um, you losing your money when it's invested across 1,000 different positions, different companies all over the world, different industry sectors, What's the chances you think of you you losing that money? You'd probably turn around and say, I think it's near impossible. Yes, yeah, slim. And and if that does happen, bearing in mind some of the major banks will be held in that portfolio, surely um, one could argue and say that your money, wherever it is, would be gone anyway, mm. even if it wasn't invested. Yeah. So if you're invested properly in the first place and if we use our firm as an example, you know, you've got an investment team in place, lots of very highly qualified people um, to, to manage the investments on top of it being well diversified, suitable for your needs, you know. Um, it, is, it is very, very difficult in those circumstances, I think, to lose money. Mm. I think that's one of many misconceptions that is probably within the finance world, but what are other misconceptions that people um, have within the finance industry? Yeah, uh, the big one is one you touched on earlier about pensions, you know, people think they sometimes aren't worth doing. And the reason they have that view is normally it's kind of hearsay from someone else, someone's uncle or neighbour or neighbour told them this and, and they've lost money in pensions because it's not related to the pension itself, it's related mm -hmm. to what the money was in, like we talked about earlier. Yeah. If it was an, an investment account, they could have still lost it. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the myth around kind of pensions, I suppose, as a good example, is that people just don't put enough in. They expect to live a third of their life and yet don't contribute a lot into their pension. You know, Sometimes in some cases, barely, barely even the 5%. Okay. So there's that and then they don't review them. You know, that, that's the big thing. I, come, I get people come to the office and not review their pensions in 5, 10, 15, 20 years even. Mm. And then they wonder why they've not got enough to live off. And it's just because it's not been working hard enough. So that's a big myth. Um, when, we, um, when we speak to new prospects sometimes and they're advised to come and uh, come speak to us and take advice, some of the responses we get are, are hilarious. You know, the typical ones are kind of um, 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 uh, too... I'm only 45, for example, I don't need to do retirement planning. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm like, you, you need to start planning for retirement. And uh, well, not necessarily planning as much, but start putting a pension as early as possible from 18 onwards. Yeah. For someone to have 45 to turn around and say, I've got plenty of time, you, you don't. You know, you can't make a big difference in that sort of time, especially if you're retiring at, say, 60 in, in 15 years' time. Um, the other one, which is quite interesting, is when people say, you, you know, I don't need advice because I've got an accountant. And people confuse what we do with the accountant. They, they confuse a tax advisor to, uh, to a wealth manager. So, yeah. um, so I don't know if that answers the question. But. Uh, that, it, it makes sense what you're saying, but it doesn't make sense on how people's mentality yeah. is like that at that age. So what is the, I would, well, I don't know if you can give advice on this, but 
what would you recommend is the best age to invest in and then what is a good starting point for people because when you start earlier i think you can start with smaller increments right yeah, but when yeah. you reach 45 you need to be investing a lot of money in order to yeah, make that money back yeah a huge amount to try and try and make up the gap mm-hmm. there's the compounding effect of money right so the earlier you start the the less technically you would have to put in because you're going to have all that growth. Yeah. The the, pro- the problem is people don't start early enough and mm. you don't need to start with huge amounts of money. So when people start and, and how much they should invest is impossible for me to answer because it's a case by case basis. But really, as a rule of thumb, five to 10% of someone's earnings, they should be putting aside in, into some sort of investment vehicle, whether it's a pension, ISA, that is, is really what they need to seek advice on, yeah. but into something that's gonna provide for their future. Mm-hmm. Um, and the earlier, the better. You know, Really, the minute they can start saving uh, from 18, say, onwards, the, the better. Yeah. And what is some things that people could be doing to save a little bit more money at the side? Like, what are the top three things you would suggest? I think that they're all pretty easy because it, it applies to anyone, regardless of the level of wealth. I think the big misconception is, People need to be wealthy to have financial advice, which it, which it isn't the case at all. You know, I think the big one is just living within their means. You know, most people don't, and it's quite simple. You know, you, you've got to try and um, make sure you're, you're, you're kind of keeping that expenditure lower than what's coming in every month. Mm-hmm. And some would argue, you know, it's difficult for people on low incomes, and I appreciate it is it, 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 certainly difficult for people on low incomes. Mm-hmm. But then it also is relative. You know, I've come across people who who um, need financial advice are on low incomes and yet they're spending kind of 100 quid on Sky. Um, and it's all about your priorities, right? Um, so I think anyone can still put 5 10% of their earnings aside or aim to or mm-hmm. try to at least um, in addition to living within their means. And also probably the third one, building their financial uh, literacy. So just trying to start to educate themselves, seeking advice. That's probably the three main things people could, could do to get started. Why is it you think that people do that with the money though? Like people these days want to always seem to act or seem wealthy online, but in reality, they're living way yeah. above the means. Why, why do you think that is? Like, it's su- such an interesting thing, isn't it? It's, it's, it's obviously, what, in my opinion, the main influence has got to be social media, right? Mm-hmm. Um, before, you know, before social media was, was at the point it's reached now, I suppose you didn't have all these people living what looks like wonderful lives thrust into your face every single minute of the day. Mm. And I think that there's obviously a whole, whole different mentality side that is probably not worth getting into to today, but people are naturally going to think, you know, I want to have that lifestyle and marketing's a lot better than what it used to be over the years. You know, marketing's evolved. Mm. It's powerful. You know, mm. people get roped into wanting uh, the latest kind of handbag, phone, whatever it may be. So I think it makes it really, really difficult for people to take a long-term view. And it just seems like there's very there, there's very little delayed gratification, you know, like yeah. putting money aside and, and, and trying to create a better life longer term. And when I say longer term, it doesn't mean you save your money for, for 60, yeah. you know. It just means like building the right habits. So maybe at 45, if you're someone saying your 20s now, you can start having more financial freedom. 100%. And habits are a funny one, right? Because it only takes, I've heard it only takes 60 days to create a new habit. And it takes 60 days to break a habit. Yeah. So it, it's not that hard to really break that transition, really. You know, the spending transition, because it's such a, like I say, marketing's got brilliant these days. It's great yeah. for me because I'm within that market. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's such an interesting thing. But going back to business um, and having a mentor, how would you say has that helped? Firstly, business, but also kind of taking it back to what we just talked about there, but in normal life as well and how you've managed your money and get to where you're at now. Yeah, so I only, until recently, had a mentor here and there. I've not had a mentor for most of the time Mm -hmm. I've been going through my career. Um, The closest thing I had to a mentor kind of early on was in my second job after being a kind of advisor for a few years. And um, I obviously, at the time, really looked up to to kind of the owner of the business. And um, he obviously gave me a lot of training and that was probably the closest thing, but it wasn't really, he wasn't really a life mentor in any respect. Mm. He just kind of helped me become a better advisor in some respects. Um, Now it's very different, you know, I appreciate the value in having a really good mentor and I've got three mentors um, in different 
industries mm. who bring to the table slightly different things. And, and that's made a huge difference. And, and they're mainly related to business, but some of them I, well, definitely two of them, I, I can go to about personal kind of, um, I suppose, questions, concerns, issues as they pop up. But it's hard, Tom, as well, because also it, you get to a certain point where there's not many people who have experienced a lot of things you have, especially mm. when you run your own business. So you're limited to who you can go to for advice. Yeah. So um, it does have its challenges, but I think the big thing with, with, with mentors is that they're great, but it's mm. hard to find them. Mm. And if you do find them, you, you, I think you've got to really try and offer value both ways. You can't just take, take, take from someone. You've got to try and offer value to them. And it may be harder because you're not where they're at, but yeah. there is always ways you can try and add value. And that's one thing I, um, I really try and do with the, the kind of few mentors I've got. You know, I try and give back and tell them about things I'm working on and, and will it help them you know, from, a, from kind of a, a different perspective or industry. Yeah. Do you think everyone should have some sort of mentor or someone that's there to kind of give them an advice, and whether that's business or personal? 100%. And I get asked all the time to mentor people, but what's really unfortunate is there's people I've mentored and who have just kind of absorbed it or absorbed it, and then some have been extremely grateful, others certainly haven't. Mm. Um, and you do open yourself up to be taken advantage of quite a lot. Um, and there's been a few instances, unfortunately, where that's something that's happened to me. So I think it's, it's, it's a tough one. It's yeah. a really, really tough one, that. Again, it all comes down to trust again, doesn't it? Like everything yeah. is down to trust. But what makes a good mentor? Like what do you look out for in, in terms of that? So then you don't have to fall into that trap of, you know, someone biting you in the ass, for example. Yeah. So in my opinion, what makes a good mentor is firstly, it's got to be someone who is walk the walk and, and, and talk to the talk. Is, is, yeah, yeah, you have to look at their life and they have, to ha they have to be somewhere where you aspire to be. But I think most, more important than any of that is they embody similar values to mm -hmm. you. Um, and that, that's key, you know, all the mentors I deal with have values that I admire, you know, and they're, they're very well-rounded people. They tend to have really good judgment, you know, they treat people the right way. You know, it, I think that's key. You know, I, I don't want to be mentored by someone that it's not about how wealthy they are. Yeah. You know, there's loads of people who are wealthy who are unfortunately probably not the nicest of people. Yep. So it, it's finding someone that's that's living a life that is probably similar to the sort of life um, you live mm. or would want to live. And obviously, there's one mentor who, who obviously I know you know really well as well um, that I speak to, and I believe we share a lot of common values. We've got a lot of common, I think, personality traits, probably for the good and the bad as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I think um, this person in particular, um, the way he he deals with his work and personal life, is a way that I I really respect, you know, and admire. Mm -hmm. So, so again, that's uh, that's a key reason why I, I I take that person's advice in the first place. Hundred percent. It's very interesting. And then moving back onto the markets, um, what do you look out for on the market? Like, what makes a good investment, and how do you know if it is a good investment? Yeah. So you know, you asked the question earlier, right? Um, about people self-investing, you know, yeah. doing themselves, and uh, and for someone in my career, you know, we 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 think it's bonkers, you yeah. know, if we we can't add on half a percent, a percent more in in terms of whether it's service performance, whatever, risk management, but um, you need an investment team, in my opinion, like a proper investment team in place. Like mm. we have an investment team of well over fifty people, you know, researchers, analysts, all they do day in day out is try and make sure we're invested in the best possible funds or whatever that may be. Um, they're all independently audited. You know, we work with some of the top fund managers in the world. That's how I can feel confident what we're invested in is to the best of our ability. It doesn't mean we always get it right, you know, because mm. we can't predict the future. But while I'm in meetings day to day, I've got this whole investment team behind yeah. me, right? And um, you've got to think, a DIY investor, so to speak, doesn't have that. So it's not about me looking for the, a specific stock or a certain idea. It's having a confidence that what's behind me um, is is I suppose what the, what's the word? It's about I suppose it's just about having confidence in the resources behind me, the investment team, their track record, their decision making, which I certainly am. Of course, and I think that's so important to have. So then it comes down to you know having a solid team in place that is legit. And now we're living in a space where there's a lot of day traders. 
there's a lot of forex traders and the amount of dms i've had from those people is ridiculous yeah what would you say to that market and kind of these kind of people giving advice is it legit is it not legit like what what's your take on that yeah i think one of the, the biggest frustrations i see in my industry at the minute is there's more and more people who are online um giving advice who aren't regulated and it's not what I would consider financial advice or even investment advice. Mm. It's about trading strategies or joining these trading groups or communities. And they're, um, they're getting plugged by almost like Z-list celebrities, people who have been on kind of Love Island or Towery or something. And you've got to think, right, I've been doing this 15 years. I'm chartered in what I do. I'm regulated by the FCA. They're not, they're not regulated. And they are almost putting these, these groups, these trading groups out there, and in my opinion, they're scams mm. because there's some uh, some highly successful traders I know that work down in London and they execute trades on behalf of their clients mm -hmm. and they regularly get it wrong. And that's all they do, again, like me, for a living. And there's a big difference between trading and investing. What yeah. we're doing is that we're doing something for the long term. You know, we diversify portfolios. We're not trading on a stock share, an idea. We're not dealing in crypto. And there's a com massive confusion between those, those two. Yeah. And these people online, these, these influencers, these kind of Z-list celebrities are kind of, firstly, they're marketing the way we can never, we would never even be allowed in the FCA, but they're kind of giving this false impression that they're making 2,000 pounds this week and mm -hmm. 10 grand this week and roping what will be a lot of young, impressionable young guys or men into these and they will lose money. I've mm. never had someone come into my office or met a client who has made loads of money trading for all mm. these groups. Because you'd think they, they make a load of money and they think, right, I want to take some of this off the tra table yeah. and invest it in a more secure portfolio now. And I've never seen it and I've never had someone message me about it. Mm. So it's what I do for a living, it's my industry and I know it's not legit and it's rife all yeah. over social media. It's, it's scary. So bad. And I know that's not even how they make the money. Most day traders don't make the money actually trading. I know it's like the setup fee. Yeah. So it's about getting that quantity of people in that is giving you all the setup fee, yeah. which is going in their back pocket. And then obviously giving signals, which is just probably yeah. automated and computed anyway. And yeah. then they just send it into a group chat and everyone does the, everyone just does puts the, thing. the bid on. Yeah, so it's, yeah. it's bonkers. It's absolutely bonkers. They might, there'll always be the chance that they might make a bit of money in the short term. Yeah. But it's not, a, it's not, the short answer to this is it's not a way to build wealth long term that's mm. consistent and secure at all. And what will happen is even if they are successful, they put a bit more in, put a bit more in, eventually get sick of it or lose their money. Yeah. Normally lose their money and then they'll think, right, you know, I won't be doing that anymore. So, Do you think that's a generational thing though? Do you think the, because there is a lot of young people that are doing day trades and get yeah. caught up into it. You think it's a case of, the younger generation want things done quick and fast rather than thinking long term yeah, and yeah. having that patience. Hundred percent. It's it's all about there's no there's no delayed gratification mm. like we talked about earlier. The the problem is everyone wants to get rich quick and they yeah. want to have that, that 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 image on Instagram where they're on a private jet or they're doing whatever they're working away in Bali or something. And the the problem is that just does not exist. Mm. There might be some people who are really fortunate, you know, like people who have made some money out of crypto. There's of course crypto millionaires that have been there at the right time, mm -hmm. but that is through luck. It's not through talent, in my opinion. So I do think that the, the big problem is um, people do just want to get rich quick. They want a shortcut. Mm. They don't want to do the boring thing. And I, I've said this before, you know, I'm sure you remember, you know, um, building wealth isn't sexy. You know, it oh. isn't, unfortunately. It's consistency, it's discipline, it's doing the right thing. And then over time, once you have put money away for a certain period, yeah. it then really starts to gain momentum and compound. And then you you see these people who retire off a really healthy amount, lovely level of income coming in, mm -hmm. or, or manage to retire a lot earlier than most people. And it's because they weren't doing the silly things in their 20s and 30s. 100%. I think it's so important to drill that into this day and age because a lot of people are getting that misconception of oh, I can do day trade and I can get rich quick again yeah wealth takes yeah. a long time and I like the fact that I'm investing into an ISA and soon into a pension because as soon as that money goes it's almost like money that you're never going to see again even though it is still yours yeah yeah but you feel like you don't ever want to touch it for me personally yeah but I think a lot of people experience that when they're 
dive into investment rather than just like day trading because as soon as you see that loss you're going to keep it's like gambling right as yeah, soon as yeah. you've had a loss you want to try and make that win back yeah. on what you've lost so then you just get into a rabbit hole and it's just it just don't work yeah um, so yeah but speaking about social media anyway we made some content in the buy yeah um, yeah that was brilliant do you think it actually helped get more people attracted towards what you do and ask more questions in the inbox? Like, how, how, do you, how are you treating your social medias at the moment and did that impact anything? Yeah, do you know what? Um, the great thing about the work we did in Dubai, you know, the, the great content you shot, is it made us more visible. You know, people mm. and have now got a better understanding of what I do, the, what we do as a business. And as a result, I've had a large number of younger guys and girls contact me um, wanting to know more about our industry, you know, and, and how to get involved in it. But also some of the other points, you know, about, about things we, we, we're doing out there because we did some stuff with the gym, you know, and, and people get to see the, the work-life balance. So I think it had a really positive impact and, and me trying to make more content uh, like this and do things like this it is really important about getting information out there to people. And from mm-hmm. someone who is like we talked about earlier regulated and uh, and yeah. and is actually has actually done it not someone who's kind of speculating on, on things the only thing i would say which is really interesting is i had a client say to me um or, or comment on the content we shot in dubai and they said dan you know it looks from the outside you, you kind of live this amazing life you know out mm. on the jet skis and and i'm doing this and she said, I know how hard you work. She said, I know the sacrifice you, you've been through. Because we've had a quite a heart to heart, me and this client in the past. Yeah. She said, you need to talk more about that. And it's like what you touched on earlier, you know, people don't see the ugly side of being a business owner, that the, the, mm. the hard part, you know, the, the stress. They just see the Instagram reels. So 100%. the downside of, 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 I suppose, the content we shot is it, in a, in a, in a way, glamorised it to a degree. Yeah. And that's the toxic thing about social media, right? Like, it is almost like a false perception of life. And the reality of things, especially when you're a business owner, is it's not easy. There's a lot of complications that come with it. There's a lot of, uh, you know, people management that you got to do and all this other stuff. Um, But especially within the business and finance space. So uh, I guess, is that why you've kind of took an active approach to start making more content that's more authentic towards you and put a more of a realistic light into finance and how it all works. Yeah, I think the one thing I realised is is I'm having the same conversations a lot with clients and they all say the same thing to me, Tom. They turn around to me and say, look, Dan, why is why has no one ever told me this? And I always have the same thought. I wish I could go with a massive kind of like billboard or something and stand outside and say, <laughs> do you know you can do this? You know, yeah. I can help you. Yeah. And you just can't reach people. And even if you do reach people, um, they'll be sceptical, you know, yeah. especially if you, you, you kind of like contact someone coldly. So um, I think the, the real driver behind me trying to do more stuff like this is get out there and give people the information mm-hmm. and get free content they can digest. Now, if they then go and seek advice with someone locally or whoever, mm. I've, I've, I've made a difference, you know, I've added value back and it's about time, you know, I've been in the industry 15 or so years now, like I said earlier, so it, it's about kind of looking at a bigger picture now and, 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 and I suppose giving back to the industry. And I think also fighting the kind of, the stuff we said earlier, the, the stuff that's out there that is inaccurate, you know, the, there's a lot of um, misinformation about financial advice yeah. that's on social media and like the stuff we said earlier, young impressionable people getting targeted by tr- trading and, and scams and whatnot. 100%. People forget how important a personal brand is, but not just any random personal brand, one that's authentic to you, because it takes people through a cycle where it's building trust, and then ultimately that trust is going to per- turn into a purchase or a conversation that can lead into something greater. Yeah. I think that's why I think social media is good in that sense, but it has to be authentic and real, and the only way to do that is support authentic content out there and kind of like yeah. bust the myths it's, it's hard because you know um, I'd always consider myself as being an authentic guy you know well, I'm surface level in the respect of what you see is what you get with yeah. me and my clients but then at the same point you step out of your comfort zone you know doing this sort of stuff isn't natural to me and then when I first did my my first podcast with Amelia you know I was really nervous mm. it's challenging you know um, 
because of the industry I work in, there's a lot of compliance and red tape, and, yeah. and you have to be really careful what you say, even if it's the truth, you know, um, because there's other um, parties, stakeholders, who yeah. are also at risk, potentially. Yeah. So um, you have to just um, kind of do what you can um, with what is available to you, and it's just, it's just of challenging. Of course. And then the question is like, how can you tell if someone's authentic? But I think that is the power of social media. That's the power of content. If you have a content creator that understands personal branding, they will give you alternatives and ideas that can really show that authentic side. Yeah. So like for me, next time we do something, that's why I'm really pushy towards a day in the life. Yeah, someone, yeah. Someone can see how you work in the office, see how you communicate with people, and then know that everything we're saying in this podcast is not a bullshit approach yeah. to social media it's real yeah and see what goes on behind the scenes and i think that's a great idea and one of the one of the, the real kind of attractions of obviously wanting to work together tom you know the stuff we did previously in dubai was fantastic so well yeah. well received as a result and obviously some of the stuff you've kind of guided me on yeah. um today uh, has been brilliant so um it's a credit to you more than yeah. more than more than me i appreciate that i appreciate that with your job how do you treat your finances in some sense like because i've always said because I, I know you've got some nice sports cars outside and stuff like that, but do you see that as more as, because I know some cars can go up in value, do you see things like that as, as an investment? I don't know if the McLaren or, or the Jeep is an investment, but they are yeah, yeah. holding the value, essentially. Do you buy things based on investment focus, or do you kind of just, now that you're in a position where you can enjoy the money, yeah. do you kind of do it just for enjoyment? This is this is a, a really good question. Yeah, it's a bit broad. <laughs> not a lot of people will, will know this. So, uh, bearing in mind I invest people's money for a living, you know, and uh, my, my values, everything what I stand for, is about building wealth, protecting it, and not for materialistic reasons. Mm -hmm. It is more for achieving people's life goals mm -hmm. and, and aspirations. So, the first part of it is is all I've ever done for most of my life with my own own money is invest heavily and a lot of people haven't seen that it's that that kind of typical iceberg why right? they, they they see this little bit on the surface and don't, don't see what's underneath and that has what has got me in the position i've got today people and people don't understand that they think like a lot of people think you know you're an overnight success no you know since my early 20s i was investing and i didn't have a lot of money to invest i was like every other person mm. in their 20s earning a normal wage and as my earnings increased i put a lot of money aside like, the, like as much as i physically could and I kept doing that right up until I would say my 30s. Now, the only reason I have a supercar outside, and don't get me wrong, I, I enjoy it, but it's short-lived, you know, it certainly is, it, there's loads more things that make me way happier than that, mm. um, that cost nothing, um, is because I, my dad was really into his cars, you know, he, he absolutely loved them, and I always said to him, that Dad, when, when, you, when I'm successful one day, I'll buy you an Aston Martin, because he, he loved them, you know, he liked James Bond, and it all tied in. It's so weird, old dads like Aston Martin, yeah, don't know, my dad's the same. He, he, he just absolutely loved it, and I promised him, I said, we're going to do that, and we'll go to Monaco, watch the Grand Prix, because he loved all that, and then just as I was getting to the point where I think I, I was in a position to do that for him, he was diagnosed with cancer, and then mm. gone within a few months. Mm. And Sorry that hit me, my system, I'm really hard, you know, mm -hmm. it, it was a tough time. And one thing it made me realise is, like a lot of people, you know, there's more to life than kind of just invest in it, you can't die with it. But I never intended to take a load of money to the grave, it was to facilitate a better life for my parents. I just, it fortunately, got cut short, you know, my mm -hmm. time with my dad. Mm -hmm. But um, there's, a, there's a client of mine who said to me, it was like, Dan, you know, you, you know, you're in your early 30s now. You don't want to be going buying something like that when you're in your kind of 40s and 50s. Well, of course, you, you still would want to. But the point he was saying is you don't want to be getting in and out of it struggling more. He said, do it now. He said, can, if you can afford it, do it. So that's the reason behind the car, funny enough. Okay. Um, and I see it as a liability, a massive liability. Yeah, it's held its value, but it doesn't compare to buying businesses and investing money, mm. which is what I do. Um, day in day out so it, it's a love-hate relationship I have with it but what that car represents is something so much more to, mm. to me you know it represents kind of it's like a, a kind of cheers to my dad and saying look we, we did it you know I couldn't of unfortunately you're not here to see this but it's what it's all about so of course hopefully that answers your question it does man and it's it's deeper than you know a lot of things are more deeper than just money yeah and that was a prime example of it you know, a lot of people do things for, you know, other other people that you wish to promise for. For example, yeah. your dad, that's why he got the car, because, you know, he's looking down at you and he's like, yeah, 
good on you. Yeah. Good on you. I've, I've had the same, same principle with, with some of my family members. I lost my uncle last year. Oh, I'm so sorry um, to hear that. It's life. Um, but his goal was to go America. Yeah. And I was, I was like, just wait, just wait. I'm going to take it to America. Yeah, yeah. We're going to enjoy it and all this other stuff. Um, but yeah, I never got to do that. But all, that is my goal. That's why I kind of want to generate enough money to do a road trip. Because I know they're going to be looking down, enjoying it with me as we're going along. Uh, not to get deep anyway. Let's move on. Um, you, you, no, you, you, your point, it links back to something you said earlier about money buying happiness, right? Mm-hmm. So in that case, it's not buying happiness, but it's doing something really similar like mm. the time I had with, with Mum in Dubai right you know and and you, you it's hard to do those things um, unless you've created um, a financial security in your life especially as, as you see your parents getting older for example you know you want to care for them you know if they have issues health wise you know you want to have to take care of them and, and that's hard to do and that is, that is a real motivator for me anyway mm. the material stuff it just comes and goes yeah. you know and, and you soon you can chase it and chase it and it, and you will never find happiness that way it's all about your in, what I call your internal scorecard there's a lot of people who use this term mm. where it's about your, your kind of inner peace understanding truly what makes you happy and um, obviously me and you were having this conversation literally a few hours ago, you know, one of the things that makes me the, mo- the most happy is just sitting outside the back of the house in the morning with a cup of coffee, yeah. looking over the fields, having that peace, you know, and, 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 and okay, there's an element of money because you need to have a house and, yeah. and, and a view maybe you might appreciate, but, mm-hmm. but still, it's, there's no cost to going out and just sitting there and having a bit of peace of mind. 100%. It's complicated, isn't it? Because yeah. money creates memories and memories creates happiness. So it's like it all does tie in together. It's just not trying to get too caught up in the money side of things where you forget to actually enjoy living life, which creates memories, which ultimately makes you happy. Yeah, and money also creates problems, remember? A lot of it problems. Does. And I see that with my clients. It causes a lot of problems. So. It does. That's where people fall short because they don't, again, get the help and support because they think that They'll get a credit card. I'm like, oh yeah, I can pay it off. It goes well for the first three months. And then after that, it starts falling into a little rabbit yeah. hole. And then people get into debt. And it, yeah, it's, it's a horrible cycle. So I agree. Money can be good for certain things if you're smart with it. And then if you're not so educated. I'll just think of it as it's a, it's a leverage tool, right? So if you're not, if you're a happy person in yourself, you're a good person, you, you will use money in most cases for good mm. and it will leverage that happiness. You know, you, you achieve more happiness maybe as a result of accumulating more money. Yeah. If you're not necessarily the, the, the best of person and don't have necessarily the best of values or you're not happy in yourself, it might leverage it the other way. You know, it might, um, um, what's the word, be a catalyst for, for creating more problems mm. because you're not in a good place in the first place. So it's yeah. funny, you can compare it. And, um, and I'll talk about this with a few friends of mine. I think having more money is a bit like when someone goes out drinking and then kind of lose control for them. It brings out the best or worst in people. So true. Wow. That is actually very true. And you see someone's true character, again, a bit like alcohol. You know, someone has a few drinks and, and parts of their character sometimes pop out. Mm-hmm. You know, they're, they're being quite good at concealing. And with money, if someone's not a particularly great person, they can quite easily get to the point where it is, it's blatantly obvious they're not. Yeah. And, it, and it could just kind of uh, exaggerate that, the, those qualities. I've heard that before. I've heard that many times where it's like, uh, money doesn't change people. It just changes... I can't remember how, how it goes, but it's basically like the person was always the same. It's just that they've got some sort of status now. That's where they feel yeah. like that they can let the true personality come yeah. out. That's not the same, but it was something like that anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, but what would you say some, are some of the habits of the younger generation? Because as an overall thing, really, but speaking a little bit in terms of finance too, um, what, what are you finding the generation these days is missing or is doing well? Yeah, so the, the big one, um, this actually like, it sounds, it sounds odd, but I do worry about this, is there will be, in my opinion, a massive pension crisis with mm. people in the next 10, 20, 30 years down the line. So most people I know who are in their 20s or early 30s, you know, have either put very little in a pension mm-hmm. or none at all. 
and it is incredibly hard to catch up. And what they're doing is sacrificing today for the future. What they don't realize they're doing to, to the significance is they were essentially going to work up until a ridiculous age, you know, it might be 70, 80, or really, more realistically, they'll work till they die. Mm-hmm. And if you ask someone today and really kind of made them understand the significance and said, look, if you keep buying these things, yeah, you're going to have them today, you know, like we talked about earlier, new handbag, watch, phone, whatever, but you're going to, you're the consequence, you know, mm. is you're going to work till you die. That thing, that's probably not a, a good trade off. Mm-hmm. But that is actually the reality. You've you got to think, I see people who come into the office and they've been saving into pensions since they were 18. They've just not been necessarily saving enough. And they still struggle to retire on a decent wage at 65. Yeah. So how can someone who's starting younger generation now, lay, leaving it till their early 30s to start putting money aside, mm. how, how, how are they going to get anywhere close to having what they need? You can't just make it up in time because the power of compounding is too strong. You, know, you need the money invested for a long period. Mm. So... That is my biggest concern with the younger generation. They don't understand how important it is mm. to be investing and, and investing well as well, not just put money into to savings, of course. Do you think it should be tight as calls? 100%. I personally do. Yeah. Everyone says this, you know. Like everyone says it should be in school, it should be in the curriculum. Without a doubt, but not just in schools, you know, there needs to be more, more public knowledge on this basic principles of money, you know. I tell adults all the time you know in their 40s 50s etc you should be putting five to ten percent of your wages aside in mm-hmm. in most cases for them they need to put higher because they're, they're behind mm-hmm. you know significantly and it's not till they really people really get in their 40s they really start to think about retirement they think god oh, it's only 10 15 20 years away do i need to do something they should have been doing it earlier and you don't yeah. spend a lot of time on it you know you just need to work out what your goal is speak to an advisor and and create a, a basic plan and start putting a bit of money aside how late is too late? Speaking of I don't think there is ever too late. And that's, mm-hmm. that's a misconception, a mm-hmm. really good one. People sometimes realise they're not got enough to retire on for a while. They might be 50 and think, Dan, should I bother now? Yeah. And of course they should. If they put money aside as much as they can from a budgetary perspective, they can, make a big, uh, they can still make a big impact. Mm-hmm. They're just not going to make as much of an impact. But it's better than doing nothing. Yeah. You cannot do nothing. It's not an option. Of course course what makes a good investment outside of like finance in general like what what would you consider as a good investment it depends what you're referring to there but my default answer for that is no it's it's yourself it's your own knowledge okay i like that that wins every time it's semi-permanent if you remember it depending on what the knowledge or skill is no one can take it away from you Mm. you'll be surprised how much you can leverage up and turn into monetary value you know you put money into investment and it's going to grow by x you can, in this day and age, using the internet, train yourself in a completely different industry mm-hmm. within a year, be an expert in that industry, and earn really good money if you're determined enough. Mm-hmm. And um, there's loads of things I look at, which oh, I think if I wasn't doing what I do for a living, I'd go full pelt into that right now. I mean, there's some areas, and I don't want to be cliche and say AI or something like that, because everyone's jumping on the bandwagon, but that's an example, for example. There's loads of areas where you could spend as much time as you could outside of your normal working hours on YouTube, wherever you like, picking up all this information, learning a completely new industry and make a lot of money. And in my opinion, that, that's the best investment. Or in your own industry, you know, become the best at it. It's not, it's not hard, in my opinion, to become, get yourself in the top 10%. You could get yourself in the top 10% within a year in most industries, in my opinion. Yeah. You can get yourself in the top five or one within a few years if you really start hammering um, what is very niche knowledge in your industry yeah so let's talk about friendships how important is it to have a good friendship group that's that's a difficult question i think for for a couple of reasons Mm -hmm. the 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 first answer is it is really important to Mm -hmm. have a good friendship group and support network but it changes with time right so as you get older there's friends you spent time with you know school friends who you might have known for a long time Mm -hmm. um, but no longer kind of following a similar path and then everyone kind of goes almost separate ways at at some point to a degree yeah and i think sometimes you can hold on to friendships which are not necessarily great for you you know can be toxic i think Mm -hmm. loads of people relate with that relate to that and then there's ones that are going to stand the test of time you know that that you you probably kind of people you'll be friends with for the rest of your life yeah so i think it's, it's 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 incredibly important but you need to be highly selective 
with the people you spend time with. There's that saying, you know, it floats around Instagram all the time about you're the average of the five people you spend time with, right? Mm -hmm. But it's really true. And, and I've seen it, you know, you, at some point, and this is going to be a bit of a controversial statement, you need to be quite, I don't know if the word is, is selfish or, or quite um, strict with how you're spending your time. And this goes this goes for spending your time in general, not just with friends. I agree. And if you're just meeting up with a friend for the sake of it because you've not seen each other in a while, but you've no longer got very similar interests and you don't add a lot of value to each other's lives, mm -hmm. you've got to look at that that friendship and, and, and understand what it's adding because what it's, it's also doing is taking away time that you could spend with your family, mm. on your business, creating a better future for you, your family again. And one question I asked myself the, fairly recently over the last few years is, I could go and over the weekend go on a catch up with five friends, or I could go and spend more quality time with two really good friends that, mm -hmm. I'm, that are definitely gonna probably be in my life over the next 10 years plus, mm -hmm. or go and spend time with my mum, you know, and get more quality time and that sometimes gets missed, yeah. or work a bit more on my business, you know, and try and make a better life for myself, yeah. instead of just seeing someone maybe for the sake of it out of habit, Mm. So, to kind of come full circle here, I think friends and, and good support is really important. Yeah. But you've got to be really um, specific about the sort of people you keep in your close circle. I agree. I think friendship is so important. I think people are scared to have a small friendship group, I believe. Yeah. Um, and I think people want to be liked by everyone. But in the reality of things, like not everyone's gonna like you. And I think honing down just to a handful of people, in terms of, this is how I live my life anyway. I have like three solid friends that I can fully rely on. Yeah. The rest are just people that I get on with. That's how I see the world. Um, not to say that the, I don't categorize them as friends, I do, but like three close friends is all you really need. Yeah, like yeah. My, my friendship group's so small. Um, I think it's definitely a good point that you made there. I think looking at who's valuable in your life, and it doesn't necessarily mean you've got to be on the same business path. I think it's just make sure your friends yeah. are striving for new things within themselves um, and also being there for you mentally as well. Like I feel like that's uh, men lack of men lack of mental health and being there for one, one another. I don't know why. I think we're all quite shy of showing yeah, our yeah. emotions. So I think that's an important personal people to having your friendship group being able to speak openly and not be judged as well um so i think yeah i think friendship groups important from all areas from business to mental health to also enjoyment yeah and then you, you do need to i mean it, it is a bit of a controversial thing to say but you do need to do almost like a bit of a value assessment i mean it doesn't mean to be anything formal but like you said, it's not about are they on the same trajectory as you from a business perspective or anything like that. It's like, what value are they adding? Mm -hmm. Like, when I've gone through difficult times, like, who's been picking up the phone? Mm -hmm. uh, who's been there? Like, who's who's got similar interests? Or are people just gossiping about other people within your friendship group who are just toxic, you know? Because yeah. if they're doing that about other people, then they're nine times out of ten going to be doing it about you. Mm -hmm. And I've learned that lesson a lot over the last couple of years, you know? I just don't waste my time with, with, with so many people anymore. Unfortunately, that's incredibly unpopular. You know, mm. there's a lot of people who I don't speak to anymore because I don't speak to them. Mm. Um, not intentionally, we just don't cross paths as much. And they no longer reach out to me. And to be honest, it's for the best, you know, because we're, we're going down to separate, separate paths and time is so limited and so valuable. I'd rather spend it with people who, who should be in my life and, and, and add value in, in, in some shape or form. 100%. Would you say having your own business as well has change your friendship group 100% and like you've lost what you would consider a good friend from starting your business yeah I wouldn't say um, I've lost friends uh, I think as a result of not necessarily starting the business but becoming more successful mm. and I think there's a variety of reasons for that uh, most of which have been out of, out of my control to be honest um, would, would I say I've lost a good friend as a result of it no oh. um, because if they were a good friend, they would still be around today, yeah, yeah. Um, without a doubt. I think what happens is, th there's a number of things that are really interesting as you become more successful. Uh, the big one is some people struggle to deal with that who aren't mm. necessarily as successful in their own life. 
and I think they, they can project on you their own kind of, I suppose, um, I don't know what the word would be, but um, the fact that I suppose they're probably not happy or with where they've got to in their own life. Mm -hmm. um, and that's um, difficult because as much as you try and make someone, kind of help someone or make them feel more comfortable, whatever, sometimes there's not much you can do. Yeah. So I think there's been times where as a result of, of, of changes in, in my own life, you know, it, it was just naturally gone down other paths, which yeah. is a real shame sometimes. It is, but there's also a cut-off point, you know, like there's going to be a cut-off point in between certain people that are in your life and you just... It's not even a brutal way of doing it. Sometimes you just literally drift apart. But then as you get older and get more wiser, it's about, okay, well, who is actually the you, right people to You be honestly with? won't believe the things you see. You know, there's there's examples I can give you, Tom, which, which uh, are just uh, really sad. And you have to become, you have to become like a, a much bigger person because yeah. what will, will happen is, say you go out uh, with another couple for dinner, for example, and there are probably friends you've had for some time, you know, you because you built the skills of you know we talked about earlier about building up certain skills especially as a couple if you work together you know you, you know like you want to spend time asking stuff about them and like how mm. they're getting on and how their careers are going and their family and whatnot yeah. and they'll ask nothing about your business and you'll go through significant stuff you know and then they won't even ask one question about like how's the business going like how are you guys finding it mm. you know the markets have, have tanked obviously the last 18 months you know they've been really hard there's very few people in like a wider friend circle I'm part of that I would have ever asked, mm. how's the business coping going or anything like that. Mm. So I certainly don't want to be a martyr, you know, I'm not sitting there by the phone waiting for people to feel sorry for us by any means. But I think there, there's an element where people just assume, you know, they're doing all right anyway and they're not really too interested to see if you've, you're, you're doing okay. And it's, it's a bit sad, really. Um, it's such an important question as well. I literally ask that. Anyone that has their own business and that I'm friends with, I always say, how's business going? How's whatever? Because that opens doors to someone being more vulnerable to you within the business world, you know? Because like, you don't know what you're going through. Yeah. They just look at the, again, they look at the grand scheme of things and think, oh, that Dan's doing all right. But yeah. really and truly, you, know, you could be really fucking struggling, whether that's, Financially, yeah, they, they don't really matter. They don't. They don't see, and then the pressure is normally a lot worse, as you can imagine, because of the responsibility, like we talked about earlier. Yeah. The sad thing is, you you see things times that you you learn to kind of be a bigger person and not take them personally. But yeah. you'll be on social media and you see people you are either friends with or were friends with, and they are sharing another friend's mm. small success. You know, um, and I don't mean small successes, and it's not not a, a biggest success they have. But it'll be like a, a small step in what they're trying to achieve. Yeah. And I'll post something that is, in my opinion, quite significant. Like when we opened the office in Dubai, you know, mm. huge. And how many people do you think will share it that is in that group? It'll be no one. Mm. And you pick up on this. And whether they, they, they realise you, you notice this stuff or not, I don't know. But I can only guess that the perception is, you know, they're doing it right anyway. So they're, they're kind of... I'm not really bothered about sharing it for them. Mm. Whereas everyone loves the underdog, right? So if someone starts a business, sometimes they're more inclined to be like, oh, that so-and-so started a little bakery, you know, we'll, we'll post about that. But um, yeah, yeah you, you don't get a lot of support um, from people, which is quite shocking. It is sad. And yeah. I, I probably relate to that. To be fair. There is one or two, I've got to be clear, there is a couple of people in particular who I know is within a, should we say, a larger friend circle. Oh, um, they're more acquaintances at this stage than more mm. classes like close friends. And they will they will comment and, and kind of say look ask questions about it but it's just rare you know and it gets it gets it gets, it's, it's got worse as time goes on you know I think the more successful you become the more you become isolated which is to some to some extent no one's fault mm. it's just it's just life you know it is it is and speaking about life what's the biggest failure that you have learnt the most from would you say that's a really really tough one because I think I've been really lucky that I've not had any major failures in life. And do you know what's really silly to say, you know, I almost wish I haven't had more because every, yeah. everyone says um, how much you learn from making huge mistakes. I think that the closest thing I can think of to, 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 to being the equivalent of a, a major failure is the toughest time I've had because I learned a lot from that. 
Um, and that was when I set up the business. You know, I left my previous employer, set up the business, and um, the 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 short of it is in that first year I had to take out a load of debt you know to to get the business started which was a lot of pressure I had mm. no clients mm. no revenue um, a significant mortgage on a house you know I only brought my my house at the time I was a few years in so that the financial pressure was was almost overwhelming mm-hmm. um, there's a bit of self doubt you know you're starting out your business you think can I build a wealth management firm it's not like setting up I don't know like a, a paper small. shop yeah. yeah it's a it's a wealth management firm and um, at the same time, my previous employer made life really difficult for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and then to top it all off, my father was diagnosed with cancer and um, unfortunately then passed away a, a few months down the line. And this all happened in the first year. And and that was incredibly um, difficult. And, it, and it, without a doubt, it changed me. You know, you, you view mm-hmm. life completely differently. I mean, I think losing, losing a loved one does that anyway. Mm-hmm. But the, the stress I went through that year, it's the first time I think I... Um, I've really encountered, um, I suppose, anxiety or depression as, as close as I've ever got to, to, mm. to that. You know, I was struggling to get up in the morning. I was in tears, you know, because I just, I just wanted to go and stack shelves at Sainsbury's because mm. I just couldn't cope anymore at the time. And I couldn't see a way out. And I'd never, ever felt anything like that. And I was trying to hold it together um, mm. for my partner at the time. I didn't want her to, to think like we were, I didn't want her to not think we were going to be okay. There's not many people I could speak to about it because no one had ever gone through some of the stuff that I was going through at that point in time, the bereavement aside. God. So um, that was tough, but it taught me so much about myself and also um, the way to kind of handle things going forward with the business. And it made me a lot, I mean, I know it's cliche, but it did make me a lot stronger, you mm. know, when it came to build the business. And obviously um, over the following years, it became a huge success. Of course, man. And that sounds rough. Like, sorry that you've had to experience that. Yeah, man, it was um, tough. But... How did you, how would you say that you got out of it? Like, how did you snap out of that tough period in your life and how did you manage it? Yeah, that's a great question. I think yeah. the short answer is just being consistent and doing the right things every day and trying to dig myself out of it. Mm. So I just devoted every minute of the day to trying to handle the issues that my previous employer was throwing at me. Mm-hmm. Um, I just persisted and persisted trying to get new clients on board on the business to, to, to obviously um, alleviate the financial pressure. Um, I did work, internal work on myself, you know, like if I'm trying to solve a problem, I'll try and read a book on it, you know, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll go and read online. So I kind of read a bit into, you know, um, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, you know, like psychology and, and working through problems. So instead of seeing someone, you know, I'm mm-hmm. you know, a bit like that, I'll try and solve it myself and, and deal with the mental aspect of it. And I think just me being disciplined and, and I've always been like that anyway, trying to help myself every single day and move closer to getting myself out of that situation mm. is, is what solved it. And then after a while, you know, it took a good year. We started obviously having some good revenue come in. It took away a lot of the problems around the finance side of things. I repaid the loans that I took out to start the business within a year. Naturally, the situation with my dad, you know, that passes, time does heal, although it, the feeling never really goes, you know, yeah. losing, losing a parent. Um, and thankfully the employer eventually was dealt with and that went away and, and, and I was left to actually build a business. Um, of course, man. But it just took it took a lot of time and, 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 and discipline, I suppose, more than anything. 100% and I respect it. Because like, I could tell how hard that was. Like, even you speaking about it then, I know it was kind of like probably quite hard for you to say that. But And then yeah. putting yourself back in that position of where you was. But look at where you're at now. It's like there's so much growth in that period. It's nuts. Yeah, so you, big up to you you're that. so great. You become so grateful. I think mm. going through stuff like that, you know, it's even when I drive home at night and and me and my partner we pull onto the um, pull onto the um, drive. You know, it's just you have that moment where still to this day I'll, I'll always be grateful for the life I have. I think because of the background I, I had as well. You know, it will never change. Yeah, no, of course. And last question: If you were to do it all over again, start a new business, what would it be? So going to do it all over again, start a new business. That's a tough one. If I was going to do it all over again, I'd do the same thing. Because uh, I absolutely love what I do. And I think clients could tell that. I mean, they actually, actually literally say that. So the boring answer, unfortunately, is, is if I was going to do it all over again, I'd follow the similar path. There might be things I do slightly differently, but um, I don't try and 
live with any regrets anyway. You know, if I think I should be doing something, I'd do it and I, and, and I, I take the risk, you know, we're, we're here once, as cliche as it sounds. But the closest answer to your question, if I was going to get involved in another business, would without a doubt be getting a gym set up. And um, I can I can say that's something I am working on. Um, nice. with someone we, we both know. and uh, so, so even when I was 18, you know, I always dreamed of having my own gym. And thankfully, you know, that's, that's going to become a reality. Um, I've been looking for, to, to kind of get that set up the last couple of years, but there's been a few obstacles that have been in the way, mm-hmm. uh, mainly with finding a suitable kind of uh, premises for it more than anything else. But that's looking like it's getting closer and closer and uh, hopefully nice. it'll, be, it'll be a massive kind of, what do you call it, almost like lifetime goal mm-hmm. achieved with that. Um, so it's really exciting times. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, it is. When you're looking to potentially get that open I know you might not have found space yet but what's yeah your yeah so we potentially have um, but then I've thought that a few times over the last two years so mm-hmm. everything's been in place for near enough for two years I mean like the, 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 the finances the things that are normally the bigger obstacles finding kind of um, a suitable premises is really really challenging even in the current market so mm-hmm. I've been looking and looking for the last couple of years and we may have just found one but it's it's really early doors yet so yeah. hopefully kind of um, it becomes a reality in the, in, the, in the coming months or six months or so yeah. if not I'll keep looking and it will become a reality over the next year or two love that yeah can't wait yeah, thank you for your time mate appreciate yeah, it that was wicked enjoyed that Perfect.